uh, uh, Phil and I met Nico at a, a training event we've ran in Crawley, and we've been in touch a bit since. Um, what do you do? Uh, what I do? <laughs> um, well, I'm a mum, and I'm a Christian, and my job is working... My company's called Primary Matters, and we work nationally uh, in education, trying to... We're passionate about making learning and school uh, life-giving, affirming, and a wonderful place to be. Brilliant. Mm. Nicola, thank you. Thank you. Yes, so that's who I am. Um, Primary Matters was set up in 2004. Three of us are Christians on the team. And uh, we try to uh, work with schools and empower teachers to transform education. Um, we want all... Um, teenagers and children to look like this slide you know we feel that adults we want to develop compassionate connected um, adults um, who can feel joy and um, where there are no limits over their heads um, I think that would sum up the work that we do um, I'm really honored to be here as an educationist because for a long time in my career which is over 25 years I felt that my work in education was separate from my faith and I kept it like that because I was really embarrassed about what Christians did in schools. <laughs> you know, the very dull vicar on the stage and everyone groaning and people going in trying to convert people. Um, I just didn't want anything to do with it. And when I met uh, Phil and Tim on their course, I was so inspired and I was so excited because I go into schools all over the country and I see this great aching gap in all the children that I work with and the teachers, and the heads, and no one's doing anything about it. And then I met these two guys, and I just thought, this is amazing. And what people like you are doing, I feel it's amazing, it's life-giving. Potentially, um, I really think this is the moment for Christians to work in the community, um, taking God's message of love and compassion, and just um, spirituality in its broadest sense. So I'm really thrilled to be here because it's the first time I feel that my faith and my passion to really grow whole individuals is actually, I can stand on a Christian platform and say, this is something amazing. Um, so, I'm really sorry. I thought there was going to be a huge screen and you could all read my writing. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, if you want my slides, I can email them to you. But there is a crisis in our country over children and young people. And if I use the term children, um, I, I mean 0 to 19. And I hope the youth workers here will bear with me. But children and young people, we have a huge crisis. And I know you will know that. That's why you're giving up your time to do what you do. The UNICEF survey that was conducted in 2007 uh, found that we were 21st out of 21 European countries for the well-being of our children. The good news is, in 2013, we've gone up a bit. We're 16 out of 29. We are very, very poor on the well-being of our children. Um, I've recently found the Mindful Charity, which is working with young adults and teenagers, and their statistics on depression in this country are shocking. A third of children, a third of children under 16, have contemplated or tried suicide. Now, that is... Shocking, isn't it? 29% of children have self-harmed. Children, young people are self-harming. We've got austerity cuts which are affecting children and youth uh, and anyone else who's vulnerable in our society. But you know, this is really affecting the outreach of things like Sure Start and money to schools to help on well-being. We are the most tested children in the whole of Europe. We have probably, I am going to be political, the worst education minister in the whole of Europe. Um, thank you. Um, you know, Michael Gove... <laughs> I will be sacked. Please edit that bit. Um, but Michael Gove um, believes in a system of intense testing. He has a very narrow view of what it is to be clever. So if you're not getting A grades, oh, sorry, A stars, then you're nobody. So that leaves a lot of us as nobodies. And uh, we are the most tested nation. And I think it's very interesting that we are, are the most stressed nation, that our children have the highest rates. We have the highest rate of under 14-year-olds and antidepressants of every country in Europe. 
Um, the other question, I thought this was very interesting. Two years ago, I heard Joan Bakewell talking. I do love her. She was the czar of eld the elderly at the time. And she was talking about the lack of kindness in our culture. And she was talking about how her mother in her 90s had been abused in a care home. And she said, I was horrified and aghast to see that my mother had been abused. How could this be? And she said, I'm not a Christian, but I came to the conclusion it was a lack of kindness in our country. And she said, I went to Sunday school, and I'm an atheist, is what she said, um, but at Sunday school I learned things like, do as you would be done by. Treat others like you want to be treated. And she said, as I watched the film of this 18-year-old girl slapping my mum around the head, I thought, who is teaching morality? And, and who is? Because even if we are, I mean, I've been since I was 14, I've taught in, you know, children's ministry. But, you know, we're only reaching a very small minority of our children. So who is teaching morality? If the churches aren't and youth groups aren't, who is teaching it? Um, and I thought that really got me thinking. And two years ago, I realized that schools were going to have to um, take on the mantle of teaching morality and spiritual development. I felt quite a lot of despair at that point because there are not many Christian uh, teachers who are prepared to put their head above the parapet and say, I'm a Christian and I'll take on spiritual development. I think that's why I felt so excited when I met Tim and Phil. So there is a crisis. And also in schools, I would say morale is lower than ever because of Michael Gove. I think morale is low because every teacher is dealing with um, children who are in chaos, children who have no spiritual understanding, who are often not being parented, even on the lowest level. And as a teacher, that is exhausting. And then you've got an education minister who influences all the authorities, who puts pressure on all the heads, saying results, results, results. And everyone sitting here and everyone who teaches knows that well-being is first. You can't learn anything if your well-being isn't good, if you have no self-esteem, if you're hungry, if um, you can't see the relevance of school for you, you are not going to learn um, anything. So um, schools have got to take up this agenda, which is great news for us. Because the other thing that's very interesting, I think, and is power to your elbow, is that Ofsted, um, that dreaded organisation who go in and uh, check schools, um, they have kept SMSC, that is Social, Moral, Spiritual and Cultural Education, they've kept it on their inspection framework since 1992. Every other thing that they have changes. So heads don't know whether things are in or out or you know every time there's a new framework a head has to check and see that everything's happening but spiritual moral social and cultural education has been there since 1992 and no school can get outstanding if smsc is not good or outstanding and that is our way in i think let us help you achieve outstanding every head wants to be outstanding no one ever wants to be a teacher who says oh i i want to be satisfactory none of us here think oh i'm happy with satisfactory we all want to be outstanding so to go to a school and say i can help you be outstanding outstanding means that you stand out i can help you do something different 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 and exciting and contemporary with spiritual development. That is a huge need for schools, to have someone who can run something credible that will help children with spiritual development. Um, schools have got to look at two things. Uh, first of all, the curriculum is everything that happens in a school. And sadly, in many of our schools, I'm not joking, the curriculum is so dull and so boring, you wouldn't last a day. Um, on our team, we have Graham Sims, who is a lead Ofsted inspector, and he will often go and follow a child. So he'll pick a child in year 11 and go and be with them for the day. And he says to me, Nikki, it is so boring. How, you know, isn't that sad? Childhood is this amazing time. It should be wonderful. It should be vibrant and exciting, and yet it's dull. 
So our biggest job as in primary matters is to make the curriculum so exciting that children are running into school. And that's what we do across the country. Wherever we go, we transform the curriculum. Um, and here are some of the things that uh, I believe about the curriculum. And again, I feel that your work um, on prayer spaces in schools ticks all these important um, points. The curriculum, there should be no barriers to the curriculum. We have got real barriers to learning in this country. I can't believe it's 2013, but we've still got issues with women and girls' low aspirations. We've still got um, issues with the fact that race makes a difference to the kind of education you'll get. We've still got the barrier of the white of class. If you're white working class, your chances of doing well are less. And it's 2013. So a school has to have a curriculum that breaks down barriers. Um, a school has to be inclusive. And the real definition for me of inclusive is that you have a very big view of what it is to be clever. I don't think clever is just getting A stars, do you? It's not just doing well at exams. You know, I failed my 11 plus and went off to the school where all the thick people went. That's what we were told by the friends who've got past 11 plus. Um, but, you know, it never stopped me. I, I've done everything I wanted to do, you know. So just getting great exams is not what it's all about. Um, and to be inclusive means that you have a very big view of what it is to be clever. We believe um, that every child is uh, gifted and talented. Every child, every young person you work with is gifted and talented, but you've got to find out in what way. So it may be gifted and talented in caring, or gifted and talented in Tai Chi, or gifted and talented in talking German. You've got to find out how they are gifted and talented. But our education system makes a lot of people, a lot of children, feel they've failed. And I believe the gift that you can give children in the prayer space is that you are special. And we've made this, even coming in, so that, you know, Sarah and I were cooing over this, those prayer spaces, thinking how special the young people must feel to go into a room that people have bothered to think about and make lovely and calm and special. So every child is clever and gifted and talented, and we have to find out how. I also think that our crisis around childhood is because our children grow up quicker than the rest of the children in Europe. We over-sexualize them, so we sell sort of sexy underwear to eight-year-old girls, and uh, children's childhood in our country is broken down. I think research shows that now you make the change to adulthood in our country at 11, and it used to be about 16. 11, you're still a little person, aren't you? Well, do you remember being 11? You are a little person. Um, so our work on the curriculum is about making learning all about childhood. So we do projects with schools, like, let me tell you about one, Into the Woods. This was with year five, six children. Um, they arrived in school at the beginning of the term, and there was a CD pinned to the wall by an arrow. And they watched the CD, and it was Robin Hood, well, a boyfriend dressed up, uh, saying, I need more merry men. Will you come and be in my team? Could you be one of my gang? And that led to a whole term's work about um, how to be in Robin Hood's gang. Could you live in the woods? Could you build fires? Could you build shelters? Um, where is Robin Hood? Is he real? Is he imagined? We did all the science work. We did lots of spiritual work because we had Friar Tuck. So we talked about what was it like to be holy then? What does it mean to be holy now? But learning like that... Oh, and I must tell you, at the end of the term, uh, the children had gone and lit fires. Uh, they'd gone and with a chap called Mick who lives in the woods uh, with young people. Uh, no, that sounds wrong. He does, um, <laughs> he does courses in the woods with young people. And they go and they live with just what they can find um, and just what they've got there. And uh, at the end, the, people, the children wrote, these 11-year-olds wrote to Robin Hood and said, choose me, I am your person. I can light a fire, build a shelter. Um, I've got a very upbeat personality. I'll be there, I'll be on your team. And then Robin Hood emailed, as he does, and says, meet me on the field, 6 o'clock Friday night, in your Robin Hood outfit, be there. So we lit a huge bonfire, we all sat round on logs, all the community came. This is a really deprived school in Bogner. 
um, that everybody came dressed in their Robin Hood outfits. Some of the, girl had, the girls had sort of trended it up. But they all came. We were all sitting there eating sausages around the fire. And Robin Hood, yeah, he came walking across the field. And all these kids are going, oh, he's Robin Hood, he's Robin Hood. <laughs> Even I thought it was Robin Hood. And I think, no, 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 you booked him. It's not Robin Hood. And uh, at the end of the evening, all the children got a certificate saying, well done, you can be in my gang, Alex, because you are a really good um, you know, woodland person. You can live in the woods. Well done. That is irresistible learning. That's what we call it. That is learning that is all based around childhood. In the schools where we work, we up behavior, we up attendance, we raise standards, we take schools... I'm going to brag for a minute, from satisfactory to outstanding. And how we do it is not magic. It's by making learning fun and exciting and hands-on. Aspirational. A key thing is the curriculum has to be aspirational. It has to get people in front of children, men and women, doing all sorts of different jobs so that every child in every classroom can think, I'm going to be one of them. I want to do that. And that's why that window, I believe, of 5 to 14 is pivotal because we know that that's when many children uh, find faith or reject faith and it's when many children decide their dream. And we have to help children, and I think that's something that will be great in prayer spaces because most kids will say, I want to win X Factor, won't they? I want to win X Factor or The Voice. And I think we need to say, well, that's great, that's your plan A, but perhaps have a plan B. <laughs> and I think we can do a lot of work with young people looking at plan B and thinking, you know, what are your strengths? Let's be realistic. You know, I, was, I heard of someone who was working with a girl who said, I'm going to be a vet. Why are you going to be a vet? Oh, I love cats. And I thought it was very interesting that this chap said, well, you need, we better find out what else you need to do other than just love cats. Because we need to be honest with children, don't we? And say, well, actually, you're going to need to be really good at science. You are going to need A-levels uh, in science and maths light subjects. And you probably will need to love more than cats. We, we need um, proper aspirational work. And I believe that you and your prayer spaces in schools can also give young people an aspiration to be a believer and to know God because I know if I had met people like you in a prayer space like that, that was relevant and pertinent and quite cool to be in, um, I would have gone with God earlier. Transformational. No one, well, no, a few cultures in our, in our society believe that education is transformational. But everyone, every parent should believe that education can transform. And I really believe it can. And it, it has to be transformational because every child deserves the right, whatever their background, to a great future. And I believe, again, prayer spaces in schools give the chance for children to develop that spiritual side, that well-being side, which means they can then realize their potential. Oh, I love this Einstein quote. Um, I just think it's what it's all about, really, that in this country we measure everyone by the same measure. Um, and Einstein says here, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And lots of children and young people in our country think they're stupid because we measure them by these exams and targets. Um, I just wanted to um, sum up then the work on the curriculum to say I just picked out a few famous people who are in the news over the last few months and I reckon that everyone who does any job well, this is the skill set that you need. You need passion, innovation, creativity and imagination. And those for me are what every school should be working for. And again, that's why I was so attracted to prayer spaces in schools, because I felt it was all those things. I felt it was very innovative, it was very creative, it was full of imagination, and it was first class. And those are the things that every school should be working on. 
because actually those are the qualities you need to do well in life. You don't necessarily need to know about the Tudors and equilateral triangles. You can actually Google that. You can't <laughs> Google these things. So every school has to work on SMSC. And what I want to do now is I want to just break that down and very briefly tell you what I think each part of SMSC is and how prayer spaces in school, I believe you're going wider than spiritual development. I think you're ticking all the bases. So social understanding. On the end of these four slides... I've put um, what we call in teaching a success criteria. I've written it in child speak, but this is what I share with schools about, in terms of social learning, what is it you want children and young people to be able to do? So in one line, I think it is, a child will say, I can work with everyone in my class in a positive way. That is a huge statement, isn't it? I bet you're thinking of some of the young people you work with. That's, that's a huge statement, and that doesn't just happen. You, a school has got to have a policy on social interaction and take action. Uh, social interaction is definitely diminished by the fact that we are in a screen culture, that most children leave school and go home to something which is very individual, where they're often with a screen, not with people. Um, and yet, we know that to be successful as an adult, you have to be able to communicate, you have to be able to collaborate, and you have to be able to work as a team. And in an age where I think it's the f children who are 14 now, in their lifetime, they're likely to have to up to 20 jobs. So because we're in a very changing world with a changing job market, social skills are higher than ever. The value of them is above everything. So we need to explicitly teach children how to relate to each other. And that's something that has to be done in school, explicit teaching of emotional intelligence. And I felt in prayer spaces, you can pick that up. First of all, you as an adult can model um, good communication, good social skills, by the regard and the eye contact you give the young people who come to you. I think it would be good to have um, texts, uh, stories, uh, books that children can ping up, pick up on young people that are about family and social interaction and friendship. Um, I think that that's something would would really add to prayer spaces, to have texts that pick up the issues of, of getting on and not getting on. And I also thought if you had activities that were in pairs or in small groups, you would very easily be then picking up that um, social development, helping children to work together. M lots of children uh, seem to be on the autistic spectrum. Uh, when I was at school, we never heard that word. So I don't know whether there's just we're recognising it more or whether more people are on the autistic spectrum. But the inability to relate is, is a real um, issue for people on the autistic spectrum. So in the prayer space, to have um, a protocol that means that you will listen and give eye contact to someone who's talking to you, but to expect that of the children and the young people in the prayer space, I think can mean that you have a real contribution to make to, the, to social learning. Moral understanding. Um, I think the success criteria for this is that a young person would be able to say, I know what is right and wrong, I can make good choices informed by my moral conscience, and I leave a positive mark on other people. And again, um, when I went on the course, one of the activities I love was um, you had to put your hand in a tray of sand um, and think about the mark that it left. And then you were asked to think about the people who had made a mark on your life and write their initials in the sand. And then to think, what sort of mark do you want to leave on other people, on everyone who meets you? And I thought that was just fantastic. It was so simple. But I've been telling schools everywhere about it, Phil. <laughs> because what an amazing activity to think about the mark that you're making, how you want people to think about you. 
uh, morality um, is on the decline. I feel the teaching of morals and a moral code, as Joan Bakewell said, has waned. And so working in school is, uh, can be very stressful because you're working with children who have no conscience, who um, no one has ever said no and meant it. No one has ever said, I'm saying no because that's not right. Um, so again, I think uh, something for you to think about in prayer spaces in schools is how your activities could look at the dilemmas that face children. Um, and also boundaries. Somewhere in the Bible it says, doesn't it, about everything is permissible and possible, but is it all good for you? And I feel there there's you know, a real moral question to be saying to young people, you know, yeah, you can do it all, you can do everything, but is it good for you? And will it bless you? Will it enhance you? And what effect will it have on other people? And I've tried to bring my own three teenagers up. I've always said to them, yeah, you can do everything. I, I don't know when you're getting pissed or on drugs or you can do it all because I won't be there all the time. But how good will it be for you? And ultimately, you know, towards your goal, it, is it going to get you there? So I think that to um, one challenge for you, if you like, I think is to think, how can you put work on dilemmas and boundaries into the prayer space. So, um, next. Uh, cultural understanding. Um, cultural understanding splits into two pieces of learning. Uh, one piece is an understanding of how other cultures uh, operate, and what they think and how they live. And the other cultural understanding is that you've had a wide breadth of experience. We work in some of the poorest schools in this country and some of the richest. So in a week, we can go from a school where it's £11,000 a term uh, to a school where all the children are living in poverty. And um, what strikes me is the question about experiences is different in each of those schools. So when I was working in a school where it was £11,000 a term, I said to the head, I'm really worried about your children. They live in gated communities. They come to school in a gated community. So they never meet people like me. <laughs> they never meet ordinary people. And yet they will be people, because of our society, who will be in government, making policies. What are you going to do as a head of a school with elite children, rich children? And I left her with that. And when I went back, she said, oh, you'll never believe what we've done. We went to Brixton. We took all the 12-year-olds and we stayed the night. And then they came back to us and spent a night in our school. It was amazing. And I just thought there was a head who was trying to make a difference, trying to do something to raise cultural awareness. Um, cultural awareness is not just doing. What schools do is they do great projects on Hinduism. And they'll say, oh, yeah, we do RE. Oh, we don't need you. No, no, no. We do Hinduism and Judaism. We'll do a lovely project on Islam. But I tell you, all that teaching is dead and flat because the children never get to talk to a Muslim. They never meet someone who's in love with God through Hinduism. And Christianity is taught worst of all, let me tell you. People will say to me, oh, yeah, I can teach Islam. Yeah, I'm quite happy, quite happy to teach um, Hinduism. Oh, and a bit of Buddhism. Yeah. Christianity, people don't want to talk about Jesus. Um, they don't want to get engaged with something that they feel is uh, unfashionable, uh, not contemporary. And out of all the religions, teachers will say to me, it's the most evangelistic. And that's why they don't like to be touching it. So cultural um, understanding is really important. That, And again, I feel that in your um, prayer spaces, you can um, have activities that engage children with what's happening around the world and in other cultures. Um, I felt you could offer experiences through music, uh, through photographs um, in your prayer spaces. Um, I think you could um, also ask people from different faiths to come and talk to children. 
you don't want 20 minutes on I'm a Muslim. But something I did recently was I managed to ask three Muslim women, uh, one who wears the veil, one who doesn't, one who's in the full burqa, would you come and talk to a group of 16-year-olds? I think it was the best hour of learning I've ever put on. And these Muslim women said, ask us any questions you like. And when they did, some of it I was thinking, oh, no. <laughs> so one girl said, what is underneath your burqa? And uh, the lovely Muslim lady took everything off and standing there all in her trendy denim. And, and everyone was like, oh, why do you wear the veil? Do all your husbands um, oppress you and make you dress like that? And the answers and the learning was fantastic. And that is real cultural dialogue, isn't it? And that's what I love about prayer spaces in school as well, because it puts a real person with a real faith in front of children. Uh, not because you're not going to say anything to those children, but if they ask you, you can say, well, that's what I think, or this is what I found helpful. The other thing that's very important is that uh, in terms of experiences, that's, you know, there's a very mixed bag in our country. We have uh, some children who are so rich, they go to 10 clubs all through the week, one after the other, but they never walk through a wood or lie in the snow. And we have other children who are very, very poor, so a great weekend is a trip to Asda and a KFC. Actually, that could be a great weekend, couldn't it? But if you do that every weekend, it, it wouldn't be great. So, you know, we need to make sure that we offer children and we ask in this school here, in this place here where we are, what experiences do we want the children to have? The National Trust at the moment have got something on their website called 101 Things to Do Before You're 11 and 3 Quarters. And it's brilliant. It's make a mud pie, climb a tree, lie on the ground and look at the sky and look at the clouds and what do you see in them? Now, we kind of think, well, surely everyone does that with their kids. But do you know what? They don't. We have a group of children who live indoors. Indoors. They don't go outdoors like we did. My mum used to say, just go down the end of the garden. Go and potter about. There was a whole article in The Guardian about two months ago saying children don't know what pottering is. They don't know how to fill a bit of time outside. And that's something we need to give children. And again, I feel prayer spaces in schools, in terms of experiences, you can offer those things to children. And so I wondered if maybe in the summer, your prayer space might move outside in the school grounds so that you would be able to do some of those things which are connecting um, with God's world. Um, lastly... Uh, Spiritual understanding. I feel, when I try to sum this up in one line, in child speak, I think it's this, but I'm sure you'll make it better. Uh, I know that I'm special, I'm unique, and I'm part of an amazing world. If you're in a Christian school, a church school, you would add to that because you could put, I know that I am special, I'm unique, and I'm loved by God, and I'm part of God's amazing world. But you can't say that if you work in a Muslim school or a Jewish school or a school of multi-faiths. And so that's why my statements are pared down, if you like, so that they could be in every school. And I've done a lot of thinking. We did a course last year about um, spiritual understanding in schools. And me and my team did a lot of thinking about what is spiritual development with young children and young people. And I think, yes, you've absolutely got it. It's not about RE. It's not about knowing about religions. It's not about um, evangelizing and sharing your faith and trying to convert. It's nothing to do with that. I think spiritual development is everything that helps a child uh, know their, their soul and, and their well-being. So I think it's about helping children to connect to nature to connect to each other, not just a screen, and to connect to God or the transcendent. And something Phil sent me from the Youth Club Association, they have a brilliant statement about what spiritual development is. And as a team, we looked at that and we agreed with everything. It's about giving children 
uh, practical ideas of how to have well-being. Um, so, for example, um, something I do, I live on the South Downs, so I go out with my dog and I walk. And I leave my teenagers behind <laughs> and I just walk. And I love to be away from the noise and away from the people and it feeds my soul. And we need to be saying to children, where do you go? What do you do to feed your soul? There's a lot of work at the moment by Georges Monbois um, all about um, children's connection with the environment. Uh, absolutely fascinating research. And uh, he says that, you know, who will fight for the environment if children haven't played in it? Who will fight to save our beautiful world, God's world, if you don't get out in it? Um, there's a lot of work he's done that's, that one fact I thought was staggering, that 10 to 15-year-olds spend an average of half the day in front of a screen. Half the day in front of a screen. That in one generation, the number of children who regularly connect with wild places has fallen from most, half, half of the child population to one in ten. Also, what's interesting, the reason this is so important is Richard Liu has done some research that shows that the indoor life has a negative effect on mental well-being on, and an increase of ADHD. And um, another lady, Edith Colab, did some work on um, the childhood and imagination in childhood. And she studied 300 geniuses who were exceptionally intelligent. And what they all had in common was uh, an engagement with nature from 5 to 12 years. We know that engaging with the natural world, with God's world, is good for people, it's good for the brain, it's good for well-being. We know that as Christians, but I think we can take that into school through prayer spaces um, and just saying, you know, connect to the natural world, it's good for you. Um, it's also important in spiritual development that we talk to children about the time for inner peace and the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to turn everything off, all the screens off, all the noise off, and be quiet and think. And I have to say, when I went on that Saturday course and I put on some of Phil's headphones, <laughs> I found it really therapeutic. I liked the fact that I was doing it on my own, I shut everyone out, and I was asked just to think about one thing. And it, I found it very um, moving. And I think, you know, that what the, the, the um, evidence back from the children, isn't it spectacular? You know, those quotes, children just saying, I had some peace, I had some time. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. We need to explicitly talk to children about the stress of our life, about the fact that there's so much information. I think we have as much information in one week of the times as you did in a whole lifetime in the 18th century. You know, so that's incredible, isn't it? A lifetime's information in one week. How do we deal with that? And again, I think we need to be talking to children and acknowledging that there is an overload, that our world is wonderful, ICT is incredible, the fact that we can Google anything is amazing, but we need to sift things and know what's true and what's helpful, and we need to teach children and young people to take time out. I love it. I was on Radio 4 the other day. I heard someone saying that there are now um, computer courses for children to deal with their addiction. Young children are now addicted to screens, and when their parents turn them off or take them away, they have tantrums and withdrawal symptoms, just as if you were taking them off chocolate. And this course has been set up across the country to help children come off IT. I've got three of those. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. But interesting, isn't it? Um, I also think, um, for me, spiritual development um, is about living a life of gratitude. And I think it's about helping children to um, stop and look and enjoy something, a person or something, and be grateful. Uh, I would be grateful to God, but even if you're grateful, it's a start. And there's lots of evidence that the things, what I love about Christianity is the things God tells us to do, we've now got psychological experiments proving that it's good for you. Because if you live a grateful life, it stimulates hormones in your brain that make you feel better. It's so amazing, isn't it? And, uh, and also I was reading a paper about depression and that one of the big cures is to go and help somebody. 
And there again, I thought, God, you're amazing. You're always telling us to get out there and love somebody. And it's because it's good for us. Um, and that's, I think, we want to be talking to children in the prayer spaces, having activities that get that talk going. And, and to me, spiritual development is much, much wider um, than just faith. You know, it's much deeper. It's about, it's about your soul. It's about your well-being. And I think if we think where we started with those dreadful statistics that a third of children have or think of suicide under 16 and that we are so low down in the well-being of our children in Europe, um, I think we have to see that, that this is the time. And when I met Phil, that was a sense I had that this is the time for people like you to empower the church to get out there, to go where the children and the young people are. They're not going to come into our church, so we need to get out and be where they are. And one key place where they are is in school, because <laughs> they all have to be there. So I think a credible, fantastic, I would like to say permanent expression of spirituality in school, that's how we can change the nation, I think. That sounds very big, but I really think it, because if we get children... Uh, aware of their spiritual development and thinking about what's inside and having a relationship with God, uh, they will be people who can change the world. And I think I'm leaving you with, yes, a lovely quote from Gandhi just to inspire you um, that, you know, we have got to be the change that we want to see. And I know that what I want to see is fewer children, fewer teenagers struggling uh, in chaos and without parenting, with no boundaries, miserable. Children without boundaries are miserable. And I feel that we can bring that. And through your prayer spaces, you can bring those boundaries to children that can help them grow and flourish. Thank you.